everything was going as well as it, I could have imagined. Overall, the race and my team was just that which I dream of the, the whole way. Not everybody's got leaders that'll go on that flare ice with no, not even a track. And for so far, um, I felt so lucky to have uh, Zig and Peter just feline uh, from marker to marker. I pulled into White Mountain, and like I said it there, it's like, well, we tried it, you know? We tried to catch up with the guys ahead of us. Um, turned out to just be a really long run, you know? But at least we made an effort. I, I was happy about that, but um, it's funny. Uh, uh, I never really felt like I was gonna win this race. I, I didn't let myself go there. Oh, I feel good. It doesn't seem, you know, I'm not gonna try figuring out what color truck I want until I get to know them or anything. I've been here before. Things are going great. They don't always stay great. When we got to White Mountain, you know, Jeff was moving well. The difference in our speeds was not enough to realistically think I could catch Jeff or Allie, for that matter. So in White Mountain, I felt like I had a two-hour window in front of me, about a two hour window behind me, and third it is. But I admit, shortly after leaving White Mountain, I remember going, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna win this. I was having a good run. I could tell that um, even if Allie was having a great run, she wasn't gonna be gaining on me. It really wasn't until I got to the top of Topcock and looked out over the ocean and got my first glimpses of the weather to the northwest towards Nome, that I saw that telltale gray uh, fog. I left White Mountain and the report was, have a good run. But right away it became clear that this was not going to be an easy run. Even in the Topcock Hills, long before we hit the beach, uh, the wind was hitting us hard. Uh, just crushing us from the right side, the north, and uh, the sled was spinning around sideways. And that was, you know, 15 miles before we got to the beach. And when you see wind like that in the Topcock Hills, you know that that blowhole, the whole beach between, you know, the shelter cabin when you come out of the hills all the way to safety, that's going to be bad. It was after I got through the blowhole um, that I realized things were getting ugly and it was impossible to be anywhere near the markers out on a glass skating rink, 20-acre uh, pond. Even on the gravel patches of snow and dirt, the wind was blowing hard enough it was hard to stay upright. The wind would catch you and send you, you know, 90 degrees away from where you were heading. We were running this way, the wind gust hits us, and now we're going that way, sideways. The dogs, me, the sled, the whole works. It was exhausting. A couple times I did get literally barrel rolled the sled. And we just got tumbled. I mean, if there was any little gap where the sled runner got picked up, the wind would get underneath it and just flip you, just throw you. We're talking hurricane force winds. It was blowing as hard as it had ever blown. It was now blowing sand and gravel. And then there were places where I would literally have the snow hook stuck in the ice or hooked to a piece of driftwood and the wind's just blowing us and I feel like if I let go of this or if this pops out, there is nothing between me and open sea water, like not frozen water, that's going to stop us. If we let go, we're gone. I decided to let them and me catch my breath and hope that this accelerated wind was just a gust. So I just let them um, take a break. Most of them laid down, but however, some of them sat up. Um, the wind was noisy, and I had a couple of dogs that started to whine um, in frustration and possibly fear. One half of your brain is thinking, am I doing this right? Am I, am I getting bested by the other mushes? Am I doing something wrong? Is that why it's so difficult for me? And the other half, you looks around and says, this is obviously a horrific storm. And 
I have a pretty dang good dog team and I'm good at what I do, are these other guys going to make it and are they going to be alive? Having stopped, if you want to call it a mistake, if there was a mistake made, it was stopping. They didn't like it. Some of them hunkered down. Others sat there wondering, what the heck were we doing here? Um, and um, they cried. I covered them in a sleeping bag. And then I watched and realized there were others who um, would get protection if we were all huddled together. And once I had done that, um, without a change in weather, um, I had really made moving on um, more challenging. In the back of my mind, there was always the option, you know, worst case scenario, we'll have to stop down at safety. I always send food to safety just in case. I laid with my dogs a while and uh, kept thinking, wow, it's, it's not letting up. It hasn't let up, but I'm getting cold. I've now used my sleeping bag over my dogs. I'm wearing everything I've got. I wasn't real cold, but I was aware I ain't spending the night out here like this. It surprised me again getting to safety. There's no lights on, it was completely dark, and all of a sudden we're just, we're in safety. I think it's safety, or maybe this is some other random building out here. Um, and the first thing I asked him was, where is everybody? You know, for two reasons. One, this is the type of conditions that things can go sideways real fast. And secondly, is everybody still alive? You know, are they pulling the pieces of mushers off this trail? Has anybody blown out to sea? Part of me wondered, I'm within three miles of safety. I can walk there, no problem. I don't, I don't know. It sure made more sense than walk in the other direction and I needed to walk somewhere to stay warm. So when I asked them, where is everybody? I assumed that had something gone horribly wrong. The first thing they would say is, Jeff got bogged down down there and we just had to go rescue him and Allie's in the checkpoint and you, you're gonna leave? Are you sure you should leave? You know, that's the normal reaction, but the way they acted is like, what, did you think you caught them? They're two hours ahead of you. That was the reaction that I, I felt like I was getting. So I said, I'm not gonna stay here any longer than I have to, let's hit the trail. A snowmobile just appeared like uh, um, out, of, out of a ghost, a ghost snow machine just showed up literally within touching reach. There's a man in a snow machine covered in a hood and. He was alarmed. He goes, what are you doing? Who are you? And I said, I'm Jeff. I'm in the race. He goes, oh my God, how far is it to safety? I said, I don't think it's that far. Um, well, we got to get to safety. Do you want to ride? It was a spontaneous yes. We started three snow machines nose to butt and from the moment I threw my leg over that machine and just went oh my god what does this mean this is one race the same guys come back year after year you can't afford to not be a good I don't even want to call it a competitor a good arctic traveler as dog mushers have done as long as there have been dog mushers in Alaska if somebody needs help if somebody's dogs need help that's the important thing we can all come back next year and duke out who's the best dog driver this year. But let's all get out of this thing alive first. Then the snow machine ahead of us blew sideways. The gust of wind blew it sideways and it hit the side of the road and it rolled and the driver went rolling and the snow machine went rolling. And I just went, oh my God, what do you mean? it's just like Armageddon. I wasn't even thinking about the race anymore right in there. I wanted to get this person back, uh, get us moving again. Um, it felt very scary. It felt everyone was nervous. I looked at the video recently that was taken there, and it's a hurricane. My ruff is whipping. They want me to grab this pencil. I just literally grab with my mitten and just kind of scribble on the paper. I'm not going to take my glove off in this. And about that time, you know, you're, you are interested in your dogs. You're looking at them. Are they looking at the building or are they looking at the trail? Are they ready for bed or are they ready to go? And that's where I have a two-year-old in lead saying he's ready to go. So I'm not going to stay here long enough for him to decide that this should be a stopping point. But it never even dawned on me that Allie would have had to stop. And it never occurred to me that Jeff hadn't made it. It was near simultaneous that Allie showed up at safety as well. And, and she was as shocked to see 
uh, me there as I was her. And when I saw her there, the flooding reality was I didn't get it done, but she did. It was passable. There was little room for mistakes, and shutting the dogs down there was a mistake. I feel that Jeff either made the right decision or was forced to make that decision based on his team relative to that storm. Does that mean that it, the people who did make it through the storm made the wrong decision? Absolutely not, because it's a different dog team. It's not the same equation. I knew that there's no way I would, could stay in a race where I had sat on a snow machine. Being offered a ride when I was feeling that vulnerable and feeling that bad about my dogs, it was also so spontaneous and, um, um, you know, wished I hadn't done it. Pretty soon you see the other dogs kind of joining in and they were straining into their harnesses and it's, this team doesn't need to stop. This team needs to get to know them, have a pat on the head and be done with this thing. My conversation with Mark Nordman lasted about two minutes. I told him what had happened and he very calmly said, Jeff, your race is over. We need to go get your dogs. There was no discussion. I had a moment of panic when we reached the dogs because the pile no longer looked like dogs. It looked like a beaver lodge covered with packed snow. My panic only lasted a minute uh, as soon as we started uh, poking and prodding. They started lifting their heads and um, we walked them over onto this sled and tethered them on. They were fine. I think it was when I was on top of Cape Nome and I saw the light behind me and I, it was close enough that I saw that distinctive head bob of a musher pedaling a sled that I was like, that is a dog team and I would be absolutely foolish to believe that it's a dog team not in the Iditarod. <laughs> to pass a team out there and not see them was totally possible. So, but it never occurred to me that that's what had happened. It immediately came to me that my dad caught up with me. So we started moving. I started pedaling, I started pushing. Um, I went from being bundled up for the hurricane of the century in the Arctic to an all out sprint for the last about seven miles. And I was sweating like a pig after about 100 yards, but I wasn't gonna stop to shed layers. The focus is you race to the finish line, whether it's third, fifth, 30th. You race to the finish line. And think about it for a second. Who do you think I at least wanna get passed by in the last seven miles of the Iditarod? I have to live with my family. You know, I see my brothers at Thanksgiving, Christmas, all that stuff. What do you think I'm gonna hear if I get passed by my dad in the last five minutes? So as I crossed the road crossings coming into Nome, as I saw the, the media vehicles that I knew were, you know, the local radio station doing their thing, I chalked it up to the fact that this is the father-son race, which everybody loves to get in on that one, and it's gonna be the first close finish you know, the Iditarod, everybody loves a close finish. It doesn't matter if it's 20th place. Everybody comes out to see that close finish. If you have two dog teams on Front Street at the same time, everybody's gonna come out to see it. And if it's a father-son thing, what's better than that? I got across the finish line and pretty much fell onto my sled. I was out of it. A cameraman who I had had a bit of a running joke with the whole race asked the question, did you think you could do it? Heading down Dude, the dogs. I think you could do this? And everything now started to kind of fall into place. It's like. Everything's still here. The people are still here. All the media is still here. And I had to ask, did I think I could do what? What did I do? You just won the Iditarod 2014. Are you kidding me? And that's when he said, you just won the 2014 Iditarod. Where's Jeff and Alan? Uh, behind you. And it's like, what if they didn't make it? I would have, it made total sense all of a sudden. It was completely obvious. Of course, I would have passed teams out there and I would have never seen them. Then Allie pulls in behind me and that's when I found out that she had stopped in safety and that Jeff hadn't made it and all the pieces started falling into place and it made sense. You know, someone had the gall to say something like, oh, well, I'm sure the trail will be, this will be some of the easiest part of the trail. And I laughed out loud. I was like, every day has been harder than the next day. Every day has been harder. The hardest ever to, for me. And I've, I can put up with a lot. When my dad crossed the finish line some three hours later, um, I had the lucky privilege, I guess, of telling him that I had won the Iditarod. And, and he said, what? You know, <laughs> I said, I won, dude. They, they stopped. Ali stopped in safety. Jeff King didn't make it. You're in third.
I'm proud of my dogs and I do the best I can. You err on the side of caution when it comes to the dogs. They don't care if they get a trophy. They don't care if they get a paycheck. Um, they don't have to have fun all the time, but they need to have fun most of the time or I'm not interested. You know, if there's anything that wants me to have number five, it's that at 59 years old, I know I don't have decades of mushing left available to me to be competitive. I'm as healthy as I've ever been. My team is as good or better than it's ever been. So if I feel any pressure, it's if I've got any more wins, they need to occur soon. Everybody in this sport, especially the ones that have a record like Jeff, you better believe I've learned from them. You know, having people like Jeff still in there, it's, um, it, it lends credibility to whoever wins these things. More than anything, uh, I'm appreciative. Um, I remember telling my daughters, as healthy as I was, if I was to tip over uh, unexpectedly, to not feel sorry for me. I've had an incredible life. What Jeff and my dad may lack in youth, uh, they're making up tenfold in experience. This I did a rod, 2015, is, is a big one to me because my team's as good as it's ever been. I came off of a near win last year, and that near win was the result of having the best team and having the best management. I couldn't be more proud of my 2006 win with the size of my team and the speed and the dominance they had. It was um, maybe unrealistic to ever experience such a satisfaction again, but I'm gonna give it a try. What I learned is it is about being a good dog driver. It's about doing it wisely and responsibly. Secondly, it's about racing. And to finish first, first you must finish.